Well, let's start out asking for the Lord's help, shall we? Father God, we so desperately need you to speak to our hearts through the power of your word. We cry out for your wisdom and grace to assist us in growing in the truth of our passage for today. And we thank you in the strong name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said, Amen. Way back in, boy, 1985, our daughter was born. I was finishing, finishing a graduate assistantship at uh, Adams State University in Colorado. I was coaching on the football team, trying to climb the ladder of success. And we had taken this job at Garden City, Kansas. And we started searching for a church. We were Christians, but I wouldn't say we were in any measure on fire for Christ. We were just kind of following the Lord the best we knew how. We had a Bible study going at our house that was probably the strongest part of our Christian experience at the time. But we found this church, and it was called the Church of the Brethren. I think sometimes they're called Brethren in Christ. And out of all the churches we tried, I think that the reason we ended up in that one is the pastor came and visited us. And it was just so personal. And he was a very likable fellow, a lot more likable than me. I wish I was as likable as him. But anyway, we were going there, and it was, it was about like this size, probably. We had pews. Diane was the uh, vacation Bible school coordinator. And I just went on Sundays because I wanted our daughter to just get in church right away from her birth. And I would go and I would listen to the messages. But honestly, most of my attention was on winning football games, trying to, advancing in my career. And uh, after we left there, we heard that the pastor left as well. And in fact, he was forced out. And we heard that there were a lot of troubles in the church. Now, I don't know if it was the grace of God or what, but we were completely oblivious. I think one of the things was we never really became integrated in the relational fabric of the church where we knew what was going on and all that. We had other things in our lives that we were busy with. And I remember the pastor wrote me a letter and was talking about how, and we were back in Wisconsin at that time, he went back to California. And he said, yes, Garden City is a very interesting place to live and work. But apparently some people were very dissatisfied with some of his decisions or whatever, and they just pushed him right on out of there. And we were just totally shocked. I didn't know what to make of that. I never heard of anything like that. Well, as time went on, it became apparent that lots of churches struggle with troubles. In fact, all of them do. And I just never realized it was that way. And as we went along and matured and God opened our eyes, we realized that people have troubles. And they're at different times in their life struggling with one or more of those troubles. And even in Sheboygan, we were in a wonderful church. And as time went on, we became aware that some of the people had some extraordinarily tough issues they were dealing with. 
And when you're going along in the Lord and you get to that stage where your eyes are open to that, it can be a difficult time for you because you have this idealized notion of what church should be like and everybody's walking in victory all the time. And everybody's just going around glory, hallelujah, to Jesus all the time. And it can be profoundly disappointing when someone you look up to, uh, you find out later that, wow, they were really going through some severe issues. And have you ever had someone you looked up to and thought, wow, this person is a dynamo in Christ, and years later you find out they committed suicide? That's a hard pill to swallow. You love them, you looked up to them, you took counsel from them. They helped you. I've seen that happen several times. And we had that recently, a number of years, I don't know, maybe half a dozen years ago now, I don't remember, where one of the pastors of one of the biggest churches in the Fox Valley did himself in. You look at that church and you go, wow, they got something going there. Look at all the cars and all the courses they had, and even pastors from other churches would go to that church to learn the secret sauce of what was making them so great. And the pastor does himself in? Now, when that happens, how are you going to deal with that? Some Christians are moving along and then one of these things happens. And it just throws them for such a loop that they just quit church. They quit fellowshipping with other believers. Ah, this doesn't work. And they become so discouraged. I want to convey through this passage today something Paul is trying to get across to us. We can have a great, great burden, in fact, many great burdens in the Christian life. But we always have a hope that is greater than all of them. Are you hearing me? And if you don't learn to establish your hope in Christ, you're going to get defeated. But if you learn to cultivate and walk in that hope that Christ wants to supply for us, we learn to navigate the betwixt and between of the Christian life. Because what's going on is you're going to be in agony of soul but also constantly being renewed in your hope. And you got to learn to navigate that if you're going to last. And that's what he's trying to get across to these Colossian believers here. Let's just read this passage, beginning in chapter 2. He says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you. And for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul starts out saying that I'm in agony. That doesn't sound like such a pleasant place, does it? He conveys a special sense of suffering. What's he so anxious about? He's so anxious about the spiritual state of these Colossian believers and those in Laodicea. What is it he's so anxious about? Any parent would understand. 
When we become a parent, we become no stranger to anxiety. We know what a dangerous place the world can be. And we agonize over the well-being of our children. There are times when we become anxious that our children don't fall prey to the harm we know is lurking in the shadows. Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And you don't ever stop being a parent, no matter how old your kids get. And then for some of us, the concerns begin to extend to our grandchildren. We suffer over the well-being of our grandchildren. We pray for their protection. We long for them to have a good life without being deeply wounded in this very unfriendly world. This is the exact heart we're hearing the Apostle Paul express when it comes to these believers. So in the church, we have spiritual babes and children, and adolescents, and young adults, and adults, and finally those who reproduce. And those who become mature in the body of Christ are no stranger to what Paul is explaining here. The mature ones know what it is to agonize over the one who is not yet mature. And they become anxious. And they suffer over those who are struggling. Now this all brings us to the place of desperation where we begin to agonize in a particular kind of prayer called intercession. Intercession is suffering for souls. It's suffering for those who need to mature in Christ. In another place, Paul wrote this. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. See, you know, I interceded as though bringing birth to you the first time, and now I'm exceedingly perplexed about where you are again. It's like we're having to do this whole thing over again. I suffer for you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. In the Galatians case, they had been made aware of the glorious grace of God found only through faith in Jesus Christ. And yet the Judaizers were coming into their midst and saying, no, you need to follow this rule and you need to follow that rule and you need to follow this rule. And the Galatians were falling for it. It was driving Paul crazy so that he was perplexed. Now, what parent can't relate to that? We sometimes look at our children and think, now this is indeed perplexing. No sooner do we have a chat about the danger of behaving that way, and then they plunge themselves right into it. What parent doesn't experience that? We all do. Paul is saying that churches have the same thing happen. Even though someone has come to Christ, there are yet many temptations and dangers lurking all about. And the goal stated here in Galatians, and don't forget this, don't forget this, is that Christ be fully formed in them. That's the goal. So that they don't fall prey to all these lurking pitfalls. And there are three things in our passage that Paul specifically mentions. First of all, he wants them to be encouraged. To be encouraged is to be hopeful that no matter what you're struggling with, you have reason for optimism and assurance that eventually things will work out. We have a little saying in our family. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. We don't know what to say. We don't know what reason we have for hope. Outside Christ, there's no reason. And we just assure one another, it'll be fine. It'll work out. We've got to cultivate that kind of an attitude. 
And Paul's making the point that in Christ, we always have reason to be encouraged. Can I hear an amen in the house of the Lord? And then the next thing he wants is that they be knit together by strong ties of love. What makes for a wonderful marital atmosphere? Strong ties of love. What makes for a wonderful atmosphere in a family? Strong ties of love. What makes for a great organization on any level? Strong ties of love. The people have a feeling for one another. They want to see one another do well. What makes for a great church atmosphere? Strong ties of love. You know, you can survive a lot of troubles. You'll never become troubled, overwhelmed, if you have strong ties of love. I've remarked about this so many times when it comes to our Tuesday night prayer meeting. Those who regularly come, we pray for our church, we pray for our country, we pray for so many things. But we also grow pretty transparent relationships where we share the troubles we're having in our own households. And as Christians, we have these bounds, these bonds that are called strong ties of love, and we encourage one another, and we pray for one another. And then the power of God is released into the situation. Paul says that we need to be knit together in this way. And when the mature disciples have been interceding with great longing in their hearts, and then the one they've been praying for does become a new convert, they come to Christ, or a prodigal returns to the Lord, what love they display, the desire of their heart has been fulfilled. They've been crying out in anxiety and suffering and agony of soul. You see, this is the pattern. These perplexing things happen. These troubles come our way. And instead of having the attitude that this should never happen if I'm a good Christian, this would never happen if we had a good church. No, it especially happens when you're a good Christian. It especially happens when you have a good church. Because people come in and they make their troubles known. And then the mature believers begin to suffer with them and pray with them and intercede for them. And guess what happens? That's how a miracle is formed. And God starts doing marvelous things in their lives. And then we rejoice at the life change that is happening as they are transformed more deeply into the image of Christ. So like Paul The mature disciples have been anxious and agonizing and suffering. And they're longing for souls and they're longing to see believers transform more into the image of Christ. And when Christ is finally revealed, what a longing has been fulfilled. So you see, you always have this dual experience. And I think some get derailed because they're told so frequently... Well, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Indeed, He does. But it's not going to be absent troubles. It's not going to be absent suffering. That comes in the next life. That comes when we're with Him. That comes when we see Him face to face. But as long as we're still on this side, we have our troubles. I remember one winter... A few years ago, we went to meet my brother and his wife in, I think it was Alabama or somewhere, and we went golfing, and of course the question is, how's the family doing? I'm never quite sure how to answer that. I mean, I don't want to lie. And by the same token, how far do you go? I just said, well, we're, we're going through some troubles, and I kind of lightly shared a few things. She's Chinese, wonderful Chinese gal. And, she, and Chinese can't really say they're ours. So she goes, Wendy, we all have troubles. <laughs> Just a statement of fact. 
We all have troubles. Yes, we do. Everybody's going through troubles. We might as well not try to fake it because we all have troubles. Now, Paul also wants them to have complete confidence. So now he's, he's telling how to deal with the troubles. He's not living in denial. He's not saying, you're going to go through scot-free. He's not saying, we're just all going to live a facade and fake it like it's always wonderful. But how are we going to deal with it? Well, we've got to be encouraged. We've got to be knit together by strong ties of love. And we must also have complete confidence. Now, have you noticed, I've always heard about confidence because of my athletic background and coaching. I mean, every wise coach wants their team to have confidence. But confidence in life can be very elusive. Where do you get it? Where does a person place their confidence? And there's only one thing that is worse than no confidence, and that is misplaced confidence putting your confidence in the wrong thing. Think of how many times our Lord warned us not to have misplaced confidence. He warned us about being confident of our own righteousness. Uh Uh-uh, don't go there. Don't proclaim your own righteousness. He warned us about being confident in worldly wealth, didn't he? He said it can just take flight and fly off. He warned us about living without contemplating the brevity of life. What is your life? You're like a flower that's here one day and then scorched by the sun and withered and people can't even find it the next. That's how brief life is. He said, you better think about these things. I'm warning you. Paul urges complete confidence in Jesus Christ. He says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they may understand God's mysterious plan. Why is God's plan mysterious? Because no man could ever find it out. No man will ever study it out. No one knew what it was. Through all of human history, no man discovered this mysterious plan. Rather, it was revealed by God. Who could have discovered or even conceived of this mysterious plan of God? And Paul continues the theme that we've considered the last couple of weeks, namely that Christ has the supremacy in everything. Without exception. Why is Paul emphasizing this? Why is, what's his aim here? Well, now that they've come to Christ, he wants to establish their confidence in him as absolute, as complete, as unwavering. And he's anxious and in agony until their footing in Jesus Christ alone is secure and strong. And he emphasizes that in Jesus Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Every treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Excuse me. So there's no reason to ever be dissuaded from complete confidence in Christ. Because God has already put everything in Christ. Christ already possessed all things. What a wonderful Savior is our Lord Jesus Christ. In Him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Can I hear an amen in the house of the Lord? And what does this mean in a practical sense? It means that when we don't know what to do, we can wait on Jesus and find out what to do. It means that when we're lacking in wisdom, we can do exactly what James says. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. 
Surely this is one of the most astonishing promises in all the Bible. When you don't know what to do, ask God. God gives generously to all without finding fault. Why does he put that in there? Well, this means that when you come to God seeking for wisdom, he's never going to say, you must be kidding. You think I don't know what you've been up to? You're barking up the wrong tree. No, that is not our God. God does not find fault when we come to him asking for help. Can I hear an amen in the house of the Lord? And then the grand promise, it will be given to you. Now, that's what you call a blank check promise straight from the Word of God. We can bank on it. Are you confused, distraught, full of anxiety, not knowing where to turn? Turn to Christ and seek Him. Why would you turn anywhere else? In Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And your heavenly Father says, ask and it will be given to you. I think that's one of the heart attitudes we need to come to church with every single Sunday. I'm here today to be an asker. I'm here to ask God for the help I need in the various areas of my life, and I trust that it will be given to me. So Paul reveals this great, great burden as causing this anxiety and this suffering, this agony, He wants converts to become fully established in Christ, and he can't rest until that comes to pass. But thank God our hope in Christ is even greater than our burdens, and that's what compels us to pray and believe God for miracles in these different situations. And it's all to be found in Christ, for in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you, when I got serious about the Lord and I was reading the Word of God, I was just amazed at this passage in Galatians. I just couldn't get over it. That every single treasure of wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. I found that to be utterly astonishing. That all I had to do was focus on the pursuit of Christ. I love that book uh, Billy Graham's daughter wrote years ago. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. I don't need to hear about this, that, and the other thing that is just fanciful. I want Jesus Christ because it's all found in him. Can I hear an amen in the house of the Lord? Let's get Jesus. Let's get Jesus. Thank God our hope in Christ is even greater than our burdens. Now the next point he wants to bring across here is We need to avoid deception. And how are we going to avoid deception? By growing strong in the truth. I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. We have a mission statement here at Renew. Very simple. Renewing lives in the truth Love and power of God. And these are the things that Paul is talking about right in this passage. We just didn't pluck this concept out of the sky. We found it in the Word of God. Paul has a great concern here that the believers are not taken in by deception that would derail them from their pure and undivided devotion to Jesus Christ. He says, I am telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. What's the best antidote to deception? Well, it has to be the truth. And where do we get the truth? Only from the person of Jesus Christ who proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Christ dispenses truth through the Bible, the Word of God. And he dispenses truth through the working of the Holy Spirit, through the believer's conscience. And he says that his heart is with these believers. My heart is with you. So he's moving on from truth to love. My heart is with you. That's something we want to be, have conveyed to every person who claims Renew Church as their home, that our heart is with you. We're longing to see your success in the Lord and your full formation in the image of Christ. As in our mission statement, we're not only emphasizing the necessity of truth, but also of love. And Paul couldn't be with them. He longed to be with them, but he couldn't be with them, living in intimate community. But he still longed for them to become more and more stable in Christ. We need this love, which is greatly lacking in our modern culture. Everywhere we look, we see fractured relationships and divisions and hard feelings. This is the destructive work of the powers of darkness. Now, here's what a church needs to be. It needs to be a laboratory, incubating the love of God, working through the fabric of our relationships. It seems that a lot of folks are looking for a church that's impressive in a worldly sense. They want to be big and glamorous and impressive. Well, don't you think maybe that Christ measures a church more by how effectively they proclaim and live the truth of the Word of God? What about measuring a church by how deeply they love God and one another? What about measuring a church by how fully they rely on the power of God to bring about renewed lives? So Paul says, my heart is with you. And in other places, he expresses a longing that their heart be with him. I need your support. I need your encouragement. He longs for them to know that loving one another dynamic. Didn't Jesus say that would be the sign to the world that we are his true followers? And here he also acknowledges the progress they have made in Christ. He says, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. So they're making some progress, and he acknowledges that. It's like a coach talking to his team. He's saying to his team, you've been making some great progress, but we can't stop here. We have a strong base in place, and that's great, but it's something we need to keep building on. And that needs to be the attitude of every Christian in every church. Now, many of us can probably recount those stories I alluded to earlier of those who started out strong but failed to finish well. Truthfully, Diane and I have seen this so many times that if we were to consider them all at the same time, I think we would become so overwhelmed with sorrow as to become non-functional. I think sometimes the Holy Spirit just has to give us relief from all that. And if you've walked with Christ seriously for a season of time and grown to where you have a real passion to see new converts born again, you know at least in some measure what we're talking about. Remember this. It's not how you start the race that matters. And we're talking about the race of walking with God. Even if you stumble in the middle and have to get up from calamity, it's how you finish the race that matters. Well, since we've been on the theme of athletics a bit today, another story. When I was playing high school football, my dad was one of our coaches. And he'd talk, usually in October, about the August front runners. 
In August, it was the beginning of the season, and everyone had high enthusiasm, kind of like the fair weather fans at the beginning of the season. But it was totally different in October. By October, it seemed that every single part of your body hurt with something. Some bump, some bruise, some strain. And all the grass was worn off the practice field. So you didn't have this nice, long, tall grass to kind of soften a blow and you just skid along when you hit the ground. No, all the grass had dried out. Plus, we'd had some overnight freezes in October. So the ground was getting real hard. Hard as pavement when you got gang tackled and slammed down into it. And there were places I remember you'd have on your elbows or your forearms or your hands or maybe a knee someplace where you had perpetual scabs. And they were getting broken open two, three times a week over and over and over. They just never had a chance to heal. To top it off, most of the teams by then had suffered a couple of tough losses. So the dream of the championship season, the glorious season to be remembered in the years ahead had been dashed. And that's when my dad would start calling out the August front runners. And he'd say something like this. Now we're going to see how many of you guys really love football. It's easy to love football in August. But how many are going to love football here in October when the ground is hard as a rock? Now let's see how many of you guys really love your teammates. And for some of the guys, it became tempting to look forward to basketball season or wrestling season. And my dad always insisted, you need to finish this season strong before you're looking forward to the next. Teaching us some good life lessons there. It's the same thing Paul was getting at in a spiritual sense. You guys are having a good start here in August. But let's keep it going all the way through October, indeed, under the very threshold of eternity. I think how you finish in life matters a lot. It's going to matter a lot when you're on your deathbed, how you're finishing and where you're looking. So look at Paul's main encouragement here. Last point. Grow, build, and get strong in Christ. He says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you are taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You start out on a journey, there can be really two points of focus. But you're never going to reach a destination if you don't have it firmly in mind. You've got to have your sights set on your destination. Now, you can also travel to see sights, but your destination needs to be the main focus. And what's the destination? Being fully conformed to the image of Christ. Having such a union with Christ that we're becoming like Him more and more. If we have the right focus, our wonderful Lord will also have plenty of glorious sights for us along the way to encourage us. And this is when we begin to live lives that are overflowing with thankfulness. We call these praise reports. Somebody recently said, well, what's a praise report anyway? Well, it's bragging on God. And saying, I was going through this really hard time, and praise the Lord. I was crying out to him in prayer, and he began to answer my prayer. And that situation has had a reversal. And the more I contemplate it, the more I realize it has to be a miracle from God. God had to do it. Because there's no natural explanation. Or sometimes we call these testimonies. We're testifying to the great thing that God has done in our life. Now, understand, you're never going to have a praise report or a testimony if you don't go through that period of suffering, agonizing, and anxiety. you got to go through that. you got to fight through the battle, trusting Christ 
and crying out to him for his helping power through the power of prayer. And then you see him move. Our roots need to grow down into Christ, just as the roots of a plant grow down into the soil in search of the nutrients that will fuel its growth. And the sentiment is expressed so strongly here in Ephesians. And this is actually part of a prayer. If you want to know how to pray, turn right here. Here's a prayer. We can pray this prayer. He says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Do you realize this? Trusting in Christ in the time of difficulty opens the door for him to come dwell more powerfully in our hearts. And that is enjoying the sweet communion of Jesus Christ. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You need to know personally the love of God for you. It's an experience. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, when you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. If we want our lives to be renewed, we need the truth of the Word of God, as we've emphasized earlier. But here the emphasis is on the love of Christ. And Paul isn't talking only about an objective understanding. You know, if it's just objective, it doesn't take it far enough. He's talking here about the necessity of you experiencing the love of Jesus Christ in your own heart. And there's nothing more powerful and overwhelming than the love of Christ. And he expressly says, may you experience the love of Christ so it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. This is one of the things that I thought was brought home so effectively through our Emotionally Healthy Discipleship course And we're going to be starting that again near the end of September, so if you want to know more about it, let us know. But one of the things that's so powerful and effective about the course is you have a time of drawing aside and communing with the Lord twice every day. And it helps us to focus our attention on God and to experience the love of Christ just as He taught us. Did he not teach us about the importance of abiding in the vine and that he is the vine? Praise and worship, come on up. So yes, we need the truth of the word. And Jesus is that word. And we also need to experience the love of God. And Jesus is the love of God. And the love of God is a transformative force completely renewing our lives. And he says... Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I wonder what God would do in our lives if we truly and purposely put aside everything that doesn't lead directly to Him. Some of you heard me talk about the book before, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. That's what he said he did to practice God's presence. I resolved to set aside everything that did not lead directly to God. So God became the focus of his attention 100% of the time every day. And he found that he developed a capacity that no matter what he was doing, his main job in the monastery was to wash the dishes. And he would talk about what joy would fill his heart 
as he washed the dishes for Jesus, practicing God's presence. It was such a wonderful, fulfilling experience to do it with Christ. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, there it is. That's the third thing. Truth, love, and the power of God. We need the power of God to truly have a transformative Christian experience. Now, maybe you see why we say in our mission statement, renewing lives in the truth, love, and power of God. So here's the question. Are you ready for your life to be renewed? And God has shown us the way. Start with His Son, Jesus Christ, and then continue on in Him. Now, if we do this, we're never going to be derailed by the many deceptions in this present darkness. We're never going to be dissuaded from our complete confidence in Christ and our experience of the love and power of God. And next week, we're going to get into more of those deceptions that the evil one is going to throw our way and how we can combat them through our union with Jesus Christ.